Welcome to Trends with Benefits, an award-winning podcast by Van Eck with a forward-looking perspective. We explore new ways of thinking about the markets, work, and life. Here's your host, Ed Lopez. So Riddick, hey, thanks for uh, joining the show. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. So, you know, uh, before you joined, uh, Sam and, and Jesse and I were talking about billionaires and, and the crazy ventures they get into and things they spend on, you know, social media companies, rocket ships, things of that sort. You know, uh, you're you're a, a young entrepreneur and you sold a couple companies. I don't know your net worth, but, you know, maybe you sell another company or two. I don't know. What kind of crazy venture would you want to get into next? You know, what would you take over? What, any interest? Asteroid mining, that kind of thing? I don't know. <laughs> It's, uh, you know, I've never, never had to think, think that big, uh, always, uh, focused on the, the prize at hand. I'm not sure if I can, I can really compete with a, with a crazy venture out there. Although I would say the two that have really piqued my interest, the, the general category of synthetic meats, I think there is a ton of opportunity there. Obviously you have a couple companies like Beyond and Impossible that are leading the charge there. I'm not a vegetarian myself, but I do see a future where uh, synthetic meats and and meat alternatives can be a great uh, part of the nutritious diet. Uh, I think the second one is uh, on investing in building a kind of a library and catalog of children's books. So really, really large scale um, in investing in that category. Uh, The reason for that is I think some of the best ways you can give back is by teaching and training the the next generation and the lessons that you learn as a child carry on oftentimes and the best we can do it is with children's books um and uh i think that's just a personal passion so nothing like a space rocket but those are the two areas <laughs> no that's fascinating uh on, on both fronts I'm, I'm super interested in and in kind of the future of food type of technology where we're going with that uh, and then I thought that was a super interesting uh, other topic of, of children's books. That's, that's, that's really cool. So I'm speaking with Riddick Malhotra, and he is co-founder, CEO of Savvy Wealth. And, and we're going to talk about a few things, including uh, AI and, and financial planning and, and, and wealth management, AI and wealth management in particular. But you know, maybe we'll touch a little bit on, on, on your background uh, just to kind of get going in, in a very broad sense. But you know, as we started... I mentioned you're a, an entrepreneur. You've had a couple successful uh, uh, launches or exits from from companies. Uh, found yourself with uh, uh, a windfall, if you will. And you know, I was just kind of curious what um, what was your first thought when when that money hit the bank? Was it how many Lambos can I buy, or what was your <laughs> what went through your head? <laughs> I think the the first thought was, uh, well, is it real? I think uh, the it, you know it's. It, we were very fortunate to to have a, a life changing outcome at when we sold the first company, uh, and so it wasn't a gradual increase. And and you know that that was probably the first thing. Uh, then second, immediately was, uh, well, what do I do with it? Uh, how do I invest it? What should I be doing? Uh, is there something I don't know? Uh, and and I think that comes from the upbringing as well. Uh, my parents immigrated to the United States and came in with a very saver first mindset and always being very conscious about it. So no matter how much money uh, I think uh, you know would have hit the bank, I think that would have been the natural first response. Uh, and that's actually how I even got into uh, learning about the wealth management industry was taking that mindset of, hey, I don't know what I don't know. So let's go and get some help and work with financial advisors that might be able to guide me instead. Let's talk about uh, the establishment of of Savvy Wealth. And I want to talk about what you guys do as well. But I, I love the the background of it because I think it builds on itself and, and builds into why you even uh, launched Savvy Wealth. Can you talk a little bit about your background as an entrepreneur, you're, I mean, you were in college and then you started a company and then you started another, sold them. Can you talk about that progression in, in those those companies? Yeah, absolutely. So it, it really starts uh, growing up, uh, you know, got very lucky being in the Silicon Valley, Bay Area in California and being surrounded by technology. I, that was, I, I was fascinated by it. And so as a kid in elementary and middle school, I uh, taught myself how to program and create software, websites, et cetera. I'd actually built a small internet business uh, uh, in middle school that was generating uh, great cash. 
Uh, and I said, well, hey, if I could do this now with just teaching myself how to do this, uh, I think I know exactly what I want to do in the future and really spend my life, uh, you know, building something where uh, something that other people want. Uh, and it just so happened to be these online businesses. Uh, and so college came around. Uh, I was uh, going to the University of California at Berkeley, uh, studying computer science and electrical engineering. Uh, and ultimately, the thing in the back of my mind was, hey, I really enjoyed that experience of building something, putting it out there, seeing other people use it. And hey, if it's also generating uh, money, that's it's you, know, you kind of come full circle of, of building a business. So I said, look, that's what I want to do deep in my heart. Ended up uh, dropping out of school a couple years early and started the first company. This was back in 2011 when I dropped out. Uh, and that company, we... Uh, we're, we're fortunate to get financed by Y Combinator, one of the premier startup accelerators, and a number of other venture capital firms. And we were building cloud storage software. Uh, so very different than wealth management, but it was effectively a way to manage and access your files in the cloud without having to synchronize them to your computer. So these large enterprises would be able to go and access all their data and give their employees access uh, without having to download and eat all that storage space up. What was the IP there? Was it the way you did that? The... Exactly. It was the way we did it. And it was, uh, it was the company was called Stream. And the way that we did this was actually we used to stream the file data from the cloud to your desktop computer. So anyone working in any of these knowledge workers or uh, in a corporate job could then access the company's data as if they were files on their computer. So it was a very natural workflow. Uh, that large enterprises wanted. Did you start that after you dropped out or did you already started tinkering with it, started building it while you're still in school and then just said, I'm going to do this? It was actually during school where I was building some version of this for my own use case. Uh, it was largely that the personal problem I had was at the time I had these external drives, backups of family photos, videos, uh, other things that basically I used to carry around and it effectively had all of the, you know, the, all the family and personal uh, content on there. Y you know, one day I uh, I didn't have it with me, was seeing, uh, you know, visiting some family and wasn't able to show them. Uh, and it, it struck me, hey, why do we need to keep these external hard drives with us? So I, I started building a solution just for myself and then ultimately found, well, large enterprises have a very similar problem. They have all of this data, terabytes and terabytes of data that they keep in the cloud. But the employees, when they're accessing it, they have computers that don't have that much storage space. And so these, you know, there's hard to download all of that and access all of it. You're accessing it one by one manually. And there's a lot of uh, system problems that you run into by doing that. So wouldn't it be nice if you could still see your files like they were on your computer, but actually if they're stored in the cloud, you'd stream that data on demand when you actually wanted to access it. And what did the parents think, the conservative parents here, did, when you told them you were dropping out? <laughs> I will never forget that conversation. I think, uh, look, you know, it was, a, it was a long, thoughtful conversation, as it should be. They ultimately uh, got around to saying, hey, you can go do this. The main thing that really got them over was there were, there were you know, financing and backing was from these prominent venture capital folks. And so they said, okay, hey, this isn't, you know, just a pipe dream. It's something that other people are believing in. The understanding was that I would go back to school after this, in their mind, start a project was complete uh, and still get a degree. That was kind of the deal I struck with my father at the time. It, having a degree was important for him, even though it may not have done much after whatever uh, we did here. How did you land on financial services or to, to, to focus in on that? I, I wish I had a perfect answer here. It was organic in the sense that uh, from the outside in, there was this, this movement, especially uh, in uh, startups and technology where fintech was becoming more prominent. Uh, you had companies like Square uh, that had gone public and kind of popularized it, so to speak, uh, in the industry. Uh, so that was clearly on everyone's mind, and you can kind of see that from the outside in. Another force was also cryptocurrencies were growing in popularity as well. Well, not the same thing. Um, it had something to do with finance and money. And so I think that those are the two outside in uh, forces. Uh, and then the internal one, the interesting thing was over the years, each of our and my especially uh, fascination with whether it's finance or wealth management specifically within finance uh, grew as well. And that was, again, organic. Uh, I found myself actually spending a lot of time with financial advisors. Uh, we can go into that as to why. Um, and then just, just, you know, enjoyed uh, looking into kind of how the industry works, what financial advisors do, where we can help, uh, all the way to, um, 
you know, actually helping others figure out what they should do with their own personal capital and giving lectures on wealth management. So that was a, a bit of an organic push into wealth management. Uh, so broadly, I think all of us had some flavor of, hey, something in financial services broadly uh, could be an interesting area to look into. So outside of the, the kind of the logistical aspect and the paper chase of more traditional financial advisor businesses, after speaking to hundreds of financial advisors and consulting with others on this, I mean, what did you find make a great financial advisor? What are aspects of the way that they manage their business, talk to clients? I don't know. What, what was it that you think really stands out or helps an advisor stand out in their practice? It really came down to two things. And I'll speak from a, what a client, I think, as a client, what I was thinking, you know, what were the two, what were the main discerning areas of a good financial advisor? The two things are, you can even break it into qualitative and quantitative to a certain degree. The analytical slash quantitative ability of a financial advisor is, is, is uh, important, where it's not just about, hey, crunching the numbers or anything, but it's being able to discern what is, uh, what is the actual important kind of goal here of, hey, if we're going to try something like, I'll give you an example, direct indexing, what we're trying to optimize is after tax returns and while well, keeping certain risk profile or better. That's just one example. But having the ability to speak that language and discern what is that analytical benefit to what we're doing, I think is was a key thing uh, that resonated for me. I thought that would be the only thing, right? It's, it's It was kind of the classic, hey, the financial advisor needs to be smarter than me in every single way for finance related, smarter than the other friends I have and be able to do all this analytical stuff that I never would have thought about. Some people value that, some people don't. I think the second area was even more important, which is the qualitative piece, which was how can a financial advisor work with the psychology of the client? Because more often than not, the ways that something is delivered, the, the message is delivered, or how to actually understand what the client actually deeply wants, or what their risk tolerance is, etc., is more important than what you're doing on the, on the analytical side. So if I have the insight today, I would actually say that that is the bulk of the things to look for. And there's a number of questions you can ask, I guess, as a client. But it's because most people are emotional when they think of money and their ups and downs of it. The analytics can help kind of rationalize some of those emotions, but ultimately that the emotions are really what's driving it. So being able to understand and tend with those emotions becomes a, a very highly differentiated factor. Yeah. And do you think Many financial advisors have that skill. I, I, I think it's it's actually not a scorecard. It's uh, you can't compare one advisor with another, and that's the interesting, fascinating learning, because uh, it really is uh, a, the the right fit, you know. And and I think ultimately, you know, there's many different ways this comes out as well. Uh, some advisors will say they work best with a specific niche. Uh, let's say physicians, for example. Uh, well, I'm sure there's a lot of analytical things, uh, like, for example, uh, the way that debt works for uh, physicians and, and their kind of expected cash, cash flow or the access to certain financial products they might have. Totally makes sense. That that does help. But the way that they think, right, the way that they operate in their day to day and their risk aversion and or risk tolerance and all of that is the psycho psychological piece. Uh, and I think that's actually a good match. Versus someone that might be a you know uh, a cryptocurrency trader, maybe their financial advisor might be a little bit uh, less uh, risk of person, probably has to tend with a lot more ups and downs and volatility. And so there's a little bit of that uh, matchmaking process that I think is hard to say. Hey, this is the best advisor for everyone. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it, I started out my career after college trying to be a financial advisor. wasn't very successful, but I learned a few things, and I learned that. Different advisors had different types of clients and different people like more brash people, people, different people like more, you know, you know comforting, you know, kind of voices and, and people. So it really was, it kind of depended on the type of advisor, the type of client they were working with. So tell me about, about Savvy then. So you set out to, to solve the problem and, and create an advisory or a practice that was uh, to your ideals. Uh, tell me about what Savvy Wealth does today. The Savvy the way that we started was um, we wanted to build a technology-enabled wealth management firm. The reason for that and what that means, uh, maybe I'll go into first, is the firm was going to be a combination of both financial advisors and also technologists kind of working hand-in-hand -in, -hand in one place. And so the strategy that we took was we were going to go and bring on and recruit the best financial advisors we could find that were already practicing with their own book of business. 
and then have our own technology, sales and marketing automation, back office automation, all of that stuff provided to that team of uh, advisors and their support staff. And the goal there was provide the advisor and the, their end clients with a much richer digital experience, uh, automate away any of the middle and back office pieces as much of the non-client facing stuff that doesn't move the needle for them, and all to help them grow faster and uh, live a better life uh, in, in doing what they truly want to. And so that was really the motivation there. And Savvy is national in the US, or are you in a particular region? That, that's correct. So we're an SEC registered investment advisor. Uh, we are have a national presence. Uh, one of the interesting decisions that we made up front was we will not have uh, offices in, in every single location that we, we need to. We, we can if we want to, uh, but we built the infrastructure to be remote friendly. So our advisors are all over the country. We don't need to say, hey, you need to come from here or here. Uh, and it's actually helped us quite a bit because while there's been many firms that have not adopted, even post-pandemic, uh, a remote mindset, uh, so they're asking uh, you know, individuals to come back in, a lot of financial advisors are realizing two things. One, the lifestyle of working uh, anywhere they'd like is actually uh, something they prefer, for, might be best for their family and, and personal needs. And then second is the job on a day-to-day basis doesn't require advisors to be in person. Uh, sometimes it can help. But even clients themselves are saying, hey, let's just do this over Zoom or, or over email. And uh, I think the industry is sh- kind of changing. So we're adapting uh, as part of that trend as well. Now, tell me about how you're incorporating AI. I know that was something that, that's been part of your business. It's, it's uh, a buzzword in, in the industry and across many industries these days and across the media. How are you guys looking at AI and applying it to, to, to Savvy Wealth? Yeah, the uh, AI, I think, is, is such a broad term here. So w- when we say artificial intelligence or AI, what, what I think a lot of people refer to, especially recently, is this subset called uh, generative AI. Maybe the technical term would be large language models, but also commonly, I think people just think of chat GPT, which was really the, the national kind of phenomenon a few months ago. And so when we think about just that, Uh, There's actually quite a bit of artificial intelligence that we've been able to incorporate into our technology, which permeates into the way that we can do things. The way we think about it is the leverage on time. Uh, You know, it's not we're not trying to automate away everything. Uh, If we can just get even 80 percent, that's huge, huge savings. But you do have some homegrown stuff. I mean, with some of your tech people. And is that right? Are you are you developing some of your own algorithms, if you will? Th- that's right. Yeah. So that's actually the, the, the it's, it's been fun to see that uh, happen as well. The day-to-day operations one is really where the, a lot of the homegrown stuff comes in, because uh, if you use just, you know, chat GPT or pick your flavor off the shelf, it's not going to be very, very fine-tuned for the financial advising use case. Uh, and so what we found there is we've been able to actually uh, spend a lot of uh, software engineering effort to create and kind of uh, this homegrown, fine-tuned version of of uh, helping the advisors. Uh, a couple examples, the the best two that we've really found that work well is by putting together a proposal is much easier for a prospective client, as an example. Uh, and it's a tool to help advisors do that. It doesn't replace it, doesn't automatically communicate with the clients. None of this AI does any of the communication with clients. So it basically helps the advisor say, hey, given the information that you've collected as part of the, you know, the process, here is a sample proposal on uh, how the investments might shape up given the, and here's the risk profile uh, depending based on the information that you've collected. Uh, and that's effectively short circuits a lot of the decision making or even typing out that an advisor might need to do. Uh, it just helps them kind of brainstorm and ideate. And then the second one, which is not related to prospective clients, that's really, really helped uh, advisors is what we call co-pilot. It's effectively a, an AI plus business logic uh, or a business decisioning kind of uh, system we've created, where every day it tells the advisor, hey, here are the top things that you might want to look into. It can be as simple as, hey, this is this person's birthday, to, hey, maybe you should take a look at this individual because you're, the frequency of the connections or the frequency of interactions you've been having over the last seven days is very is an outlier compared, compared to what it was last month. It could be their investment allocation is drifted too far, too much cash appear, or some other alert happened. The whole suite of things that kind of bake into this this uh, automated checklist, so to speak, 
and advisors, uh, it really helps advisors guide the the actionable parts of the day versus having to go through every client's thinking, hmm, should I have reached out to this person? And it's not, and, and the reason that AI is helpful here, by the way, is that it's not a one size fits all. An advisor can't just say, hey, well, I'm going to talk to every client every week. They know some clients just never want to be bothered. And so the AI won't start prompting, hey, you've been a week, it's been a week, why don't you talk to this individual? So it fine tunes and automatically learns based on past behavior, what is expected uh, to come in the future. So is everything tied to, to that engine, contact management system, emails, whatever they do, you capturing all that data? That's that's exactly right. And that was a, that was a big, big uh, lift internally to do. But the, the principle we had was to actually be effective at at applying technology, right? And we, we don't want to just create a nice, pretty interface and on top of something else and call it a day, was we had to be able to build the entire engine uh, from, uh, from from the ground up. Uh, so that meant all the data uh, lives in different parts, right? The, the CRM has a lot of the customer data. Uh, other systems might have the actual investments data. Obviously, the custodian does uh, the portfolios and, and all of that stuff. Uh, where trading happens might be actually completely different. You might be storing the models and doing rebalancing in different uh, different systems. So we said we need to have all of that in one place, connect all of these systems together, associating with households to individuals to different account types to the different portfolios and and risk tolerances and all of that stuff. And only then can we first make the advisor's life easier so you don't have to split between different things. But second, you can do these you know insightful things like generate using AI to suggest, hey, maybe you should be doing this because you have everything in one place. So are you, you know, as you grow the business and, and bring on new financial advisors, is that the carrot or what, you know, what, what brings the financial advisors over to, to Savvy Wealth? Um, the technology, is it the uh, work from home or work uh, remotely uh, aspect? I imagine all of it. <laughs> it, it, it. It's, it really is all, all of it. it, it it's, um, uh, I, I think I, I, I keep saying this, but uh, there's no one size fits all uh, because every advisor has a different pain point that we talk to. So we spend a lot of time in the first few conversations when we are reaching out or they've reached out to us, just understanding uh, hey, what are the pain points, right? This isn't a place that we just want to say, hey, hey if, you have an, if you're an advisor and have a pulse, like, come on in. We want to make sure this actually helps you. Uh, and that's kind of the core thesis, right? We want to support and help the advisors. A large part of that typically has to do with, hey, I, you know, I, I feel like I'm not doing things efficiently. I feel like the technology is holding me back. I'm frustrated with the way that things are done right now. Some version of that, which then can be answered by, hey, the technology could be one way that this, you know, you could help you. Uh, we also have centralized operations and client servicing team that can also help uh, alleviate some of that stuff because we don't think that technology replaces 100% of it, right? It's always an 80-20. So if we can take away 80% of the job, and at least, you know, we've done, we've done already good work. So that, that's one component. Other times, it's just, uh, you know, some people say, hey, I feel a little bit isolated. Uh, and I'm working kind of independently as part of a, a platform or a broker dealer. And I don't, you know, there's no community around me of other advisors. So that's another kind of selling point at times. Uh, the remote kind of work from anywhere is another selling point. It really depends. But I think what we've realized is by being very thoughtful about be, building a firm, not just, hey, we're a software solution and that's the only thing we do, has allowed us to really address and solve a lot of the pain points that advisors have, which isn't always just technology. It's a big part, but there's all the other parts as well. Now, you guys do direct indexing as well. Is that right? That's correct. Maybe you can tell me a little bit about that part of the, the business, because as an ETF guy, I'm still making up my mind about it. I think it's super interesting. Some people say it's going to take over the world or take over ETFs. I don't know. What's what's your take on on its relationship to ETFs in the, in the fund world? I, yeah, I think uh, uh, anything that goes to the extreme, I think is always uh, overblown, right? It's the same thing. Robo-advisors are going to take over the world and, and financial advisors out. I think similarly, like it, it's very difficult to say, hey, something's going to be completely replaced. Uh, very few times in history does that actually happen in, in totality and so quickly. I think both of them, uh, we'll call it ETFs broadly and, and direct indexing, and there's different flavors, obviously, uh, coexist. And they actually have, um, uh, th there's pros and cons to both of them. Just at a very high level, if you think about it, uh, a typical direct indexing portfolio, direct index portfolio is actually more difficult to manage uh, and also psychologically difficult to see. A lot of clients will say, hey, why do I have so many different securities, right? So again, it goes back to the analytical and psychological portions of the, the business. Uh, and you could argue, hey, ETFs are easier. I mean, it's it's one thing, it's well understood, it's easier to manage there. 
at the same time, you have other benefits in direct indexing, like uh, maybe you can do more granular tax loss harvesting. A lot of folks actually like that feature. Uh, harder to do on the ETF side. So it really is, again, picking your flavor. I think both of them have a place in the industry. Uh, I think we're seeing a wave transition and learn about e direct indexing. So that's why it's the hot topic. Doesn't mean that ETFs are going away. Now, at one point, direct indexing was really only available for like US equities. Has that broadened out to uh, international equities, fixed income? It, it has. It has. And I think if you kind of broadly think about those three areas, US equities is still the most popular. International equities, you can't actually do, you know, clever direct indexing or in tax loss harvesting on. There is a, it is a higher, just inherently a higher fee structure. We're dealing with uh, ADRs typically with international uh, securities. And so that does incur fees versus we're now at a zero trading fee a world for US equities primarily. Uh, so that's another consideration typically. Fixed income is actually the most difficult. Uh, you, it, it's, it's difficult to apply direct indexing. There are one or two companies out there that have done an excellent job at trying to crack that. But I would say that's probably the most nascent in, in the direct indexing world. Yeah, it's hard to trade in, in person anyway, you know, okay, in sure. real life. And speaking of direct indexing, you know, as different shops develop their direct indexing capabilities and offerings, what would you offer as ways to help people try to differentiate one's direct indexing from another? Are there certain risk metrics to look at? Or, or what do you look at to help differentiate your own capabilities in direct indexing versus another? The way that we think about it is the more flexibility in options and knobs and whistles that we have the ability to control on a, from a direct indexing perspective, it, the better. Um, and, and again, it goes back to uh, the differentiation for direct indexing. One of the large value props, uh, aside from the tax loss harvesting and, and all of that stuff, is uh, you get to customize portfolios, right? And clients actually like that approach as well. It's, it's you know, it could be as simple as, hey, I want to slightly tilt it to maybe more environmental friendly stocks, all the way to very complex factors that they want to start incorporating into the, the portfolio. If you think about it from just that principle itself, then the advantage of one direct indexing platform versus another one is going to be based on, hey, how customizable can we make it? Uh, and that is a key component. Uh, and it's it's not easy to say every single option and, and variable can be customized that because each of them has its own nuances in terms of how to actually execute those those trades and how frequently that's really going to be the north star to differentiate. Fantastic. And what's the best way for people to learn more about about savvy? If you go to savvywealth.com, you can sign up there for the waitlist. We will uh, we'll be sending out updates on progress in the company. You can also follow us on LinkedIn, Savvy Wealth. Uh, and we post content and news there uh, regularly as well. That's awesome. Uh, and, you know, we kind of started out with some long-term trends. Uh, you know, as I told you before, one of the ways I, I close the podcast is asking about one long-term trend you see playing out over the next year or several years. You gave me a couple already, but I don't know if you had any other thoughts about that. I think the, the long-term trend, uh, since we're talking about artificial intelligence, I think that one is, uh, it, it is certainly uh, something we've been thinking about uh, and generally, the question that I, that I'm always trying to think about is, hey, wh what are the things, or what are the areas that artificial intelligence will actually be uh, disruptive? You know, I think we talked a lot about the wealth management uh, space, but I think broadly speaking, the the best way to describe it is anything that has a deterministic outcome uh, in the job that you do actually has a lot of applicability for artificial intelligence. Uh, so if you think about uh, uh, actually, a use case right now where uh, computer programmers uh, actually are able to use artificial intelligence to help them write code because code is actually very deterministic in in how it executes for the most part, and so that actually is a very good use case. Uh, things like emails and things like that uh, is is also not bad of a bit bad of a use case, and there's actually applicability in in medicine as well uh, for certain things. I think that's kind of the broad trend of. Hey, where can AI be applied? Obviously, kind of across industries, but wealth management, it's any of those deterministic tasks that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So I close off the podcast with a segment called Trend or Fad. It's kind of our speed round. I'll ask you about three or five different topics and get your quick take. You ready? Sounds good. Cryptocurrency, Trend or Fad? I think it's a fad. Whoa, I was not expecting that one. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> electric vehicles, Trend or Fad? Trend. I think it's the future. Psychedelic therapy, trend or fad? I'm kind of split in the middle, uh, but I will say trend. I think there's a lot of people that go very extreme on it uh, or, or the other way. I think there's an answer somewhere in the middle. There's probably some use case uh, 
I'm just not educated enough to know what that is. Uh, Riddick, this is this is great. Thank you very much for the conversation and coming on the show. Thank you. This is a pleasure. And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Trends with Benefits. <laughs>